On a residential block in the seaside town of Pacific Grove, California, sits a modest house with a grand history. Behind its garage in a small carriage house, one of the seminal events in personal computing history took place. The first modern operating system for the microcomputer was born here over 20 years ago. It was called CPM, and its inventor was a young computer science teacher named Gary Kildall. Kildall had started developing his control program for microcomputers, also known as control program monitor, in the early 1970s when he realized the potential for a general purpose small computer. He was carrying a portable computer at a time when the desktop PC was just a dream. I met Gary in 1973 in the computer science lab late one evening. He was a uh, young kid, freckled, reddish hair, uh, boyish enthusiasm, was in cutoffs, came into the computer center with a leather brief briefcase that he flipped open and connected to a teletype, an ASR33. And that was an entire self-contained computer. It was the first personal computer I ever saw. And I went wild. I wanted to know where he got it, how he got it, what he was doing with it, how I could get one. Gary studied computer science at the University of Washington and went on to obtain a doctorate. He soon moved to the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, where he later became a professor. In the 1970s, the seeds of CPM were planted during his teaching career at Monterey. He continued to work on the project at home and later in this tiny rooftop office above a restaurant in Pacific Grove. The first thing I, I heard of, that, that Gary did that was really brought to my attention was he, he invented a programming language called PLM and implemented it for the Intel microprocessors to prove that, that the 8088 was, or the 8080, I'm sorry, was a real computer and not a controller for, for microwave ovens, but that it was a real computer. And he went off and, and, and wrote a programming language that ran on microcomputers. Now we can say, well, well, of course that's no big deal, but at the time it was a pretty big deal. He, he invented this language. And then to show that the language was useful, he wrote CPM. That's what really actually happened. He created this operating system and, and built it around this Intel microprocessor to show what could be done with microprocessors. And in 1975, when he was doing this, that was pretty revolutionary. Gary's approach to computing was far ahead of the conventional notions of the time. While a consultant at Intel in the 70s, he offered to sell them CPM, but Intel could see no use for it and turned him down. Shortly afterwards, in 1976, Gary and his wife Dorothy founded a company called Intergalactic Digital Research, later shortened to Digital Research in an old Victorian home. In the early days, Digital Research Incorporated, or DRI, was CPM. While the operating system is just a dim memory in most PC users' minds today, its role in the development of the microcomputer was pivotal. What's so important about the work that Gary did was the fact that he was one of the first to introduce uh, an operating system for personal computers that began laying the groundwork that basically all other personal computer operating systems, hardware design, and applications can take their roots from. The main thing that CPM brought that was different from how anybody else was approaching microcomputers was that Gary made a logical separation of the physical I.O. system from what was called the BDOS. The physical I.O. system was called the BIOS, the basic I.O. system, and that was a term that Gary used in early CPM. The BDOS was a basic disk operating system. The BDOS was independent of the specific hardware that you had in your microcomputer. By comparison, and we're looking at the time of, uh, of Unix being out as a major mini computer operating system, and you could not move executables of any application programs from one Unix machine, unless it was an identical machine, to another system. So this was really a remarkable innovation. CPM sold extremely well, and DRI flourished. The company expanded to larger quarters across the street. The number of employees grew from 9 to 24. When a new Vax mini computer arrived, it was too large to fit inside the building, so the entire structure was lifted off its foundation to accommodate the machine. A beaming Gary told the staff they would all be getting a raise that week. It was a time of skyrocketing growth. By August of 1982, 
The company newsletter reported that DRI's revenues had grown over 1,000% in the past two years. DRI now had 200 employees. CPM was established as the industry standard and the most popular 8-bit operating system in the world. When the computer industry was just starting up, there was, there was the computer industry. There was IBM and the Seven Dwarves and, and the, the, the mainframe industry dominated by, by glass houses and, 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 and giant mainframe computers. It cost millions and millions of dollars. And, and the, the personal computer industry did not descend genealogically from that uh, gene pool. It sprung up in a completely separate way, in a completely separate place. And Gary was its spiritual leader. He, his company was the biggest and most successful of all of the companies. And all of the companies were modeled after Gary's. Gary was a very busy guy. He was chairman of a large company. He was personally involved in new product development. Yet every two weeks, he would spend four hours driving up and down this Pacific Coast Highway to spend a day in front of the cameras. When we come back, Gary's new role as a television host. With DRI's business growing, Gary went on to other pursuits, including the role of co-host on Computer Chronicles. His second career as television host lasted over six years, during which he provided acute insights into the technology and potential of hundreds of products. While appearing on the program, he also showed off products and technologies of his own that were far ahead of the market, including a multitasking operating system for PCs called Concurrent DOS. Um, what's even more interesting is that all is not quite as it appears because, in fact, if you uh, press a little key here, you actually see that there are lots and lots of processes actually running, lots of tasks running here. And, in fact, on these serial terminals even themselves, I can hit a key on this one, for example, and find that uh, I'm running DBase 3 at the mm -hmm. same time. So what we're seeing here is the ability of the IBM PS2 Model 80 as a 386-based machine um, in conjunction with concurrent DOS 386, its ability to run both standard DOS applications, because the operating system is completely DOS compatible, but to be able to run multiple DOS applications and to allow shared access to them. DRI also had one of the first graphical user interfaces called GEM. I'll open up a pre-prepared uh, graph and we'll see what the combination of text and graphics look like. I'm going to go to a full scale full screen here you can see uh -huh. here's the final result of putting it together text with graphics and I'll just go ahead and send this to the output device and in this case we're going to just use a screen but it could be a slide uh, maker or um, oh, uh, over a transparency uh -huh. maker whatever it happens to be. And that, that well I think that his interest was in um, first of all showing that digital research was still the leader um, and not um, and that we had, since graphical environments were sort of becoming hot, if you will, and, uh, you know, the Lisa hadn't really been successful, but word on the street was, you know, Macintosh was coming, and, and the fact that he could go and show a multitasking, graphical-oriented environment um, running as a digital research project that no one knew at all that we were even working on, I think he appreciated the kind of surprise factor of that. And, uh, and he's, I remember him coming back and saying that... Um, you know, Bill Gates and other people were at this uh, conference that Esther Dyson had, and they were like, eyes were like glued to the screen trying to, you know, see what, what that was going on. So I think we put some fear in Microsoft, and I think Gary liked that.